This is the sixth video in the video series of orbital mechanics with Python. In this one, I'm going to be talking about the Keplerian orbital elements and how you can implement it in the Python. So the Keplerian orbital elements, I've mentioned them a few times, but there's these six values that you can use to describe any two-body orbit. Um, they're just much more intuitive than R and V vectors once you get to see them because R and V vectors are kind of just some arbitrary you know, distance and velocity that's going to greatly differ from body to body. But the point of the Keplerian orbital elements is that they're more intuitive and it's easier to visualize an orbit given these values. And you can see that here. Um, initially, it might not be easier, but it actually does make a bit more sense um, when you get to like actually practicing with these for a while and getting to know them. Uh, dark reader all because I can't see that. Okay, so I'm just going to do a little bit of explaining what's going on here. So say this yellow plane is your orbit, um, and you're currently here. The satellite is currently here on its orbit. So some angles, I think the easiest angle to figure out, um, this plane of reference um, is usually the equatorial plane for the Earth in this Earth center inertial frame. Um, yeah, Earth's equatorial plane. Um, so you can see the reference direction here. That is a, a that symbol is the first point of Aries. Uh, the vernal point, um, it's called a few different things, but um, it's just uh, some reference direction that is inertially fixed. Um, I think I'll post a video on how to define the Earth center inertial because it's actually kind of complicated. Um, but this is just a plane of reference that is inertial. Um, so you have your orbit that's going in this way, um, and you assume your orbit is going in this direction. So as it comes up through um, the plane of reference here, there is it's called the ascending node. Um, and then on the other side, when it goes down, that's called a descending node, but that's not on this one, so that's okay. On um, the first angle to see here, it's uh, pretty um, easy to kind of tell what's going on is inclination. Um, so if you have an equatorial orbit, your inclination is going to be zero. You can think of this whole plane as being rotated downward to the reference plane. Uh, but in here, it just has some arbitrary inclination. Um, another one to see is the argument of periapsis. So uh, this point is the perigee point, or the periapsis point, the point closest to the central body in the orbit. Um, and this argument of periapsis is the angle between the line to the ascending node and the perigee. Um, this longitude of ascending node is the angle between the reference direction, so this in this case, and then to that again the line to the ascending node from the central um, to the central body. And then another angle here uh, is your true anomaly. This one's also kind of easy to figure out. Um, it's the angle between your perigee and where you currently are at the moment. Uh, so here it's not too far from its perigee. If it was at apogee, your true anomaly is 180 degrees. Um, yeah, that's that. And the two other ones are eccentricity and sinusoidal axis, which are right here. Um, so how elliptical is your orbit? If it's a circle, it's zero. If it's one, it's a parabola. If it's more than one, it's hyperbola, which means you're escaping. Um, and then sinusoidal axis is basically how large your orbit is, and you can see a definition. And I'll post another video on this. It kind of takes more time to explain this, but that's just in the general sense what the class or the Keplerian elements are. Sometimes they're called classical orbital elements. Um, yeah, so get into the software. I want to come back to some definitions. Um, okay, so one thing that I wanted to do is change this orbit propagator, um, where instead of passing in an R0 and V0, you're just going to pass in an initial state. It's called false. So you can pass an initial state that it's either a classical orbital element or just a state vector. That way you can, again, hide it in level abstraction and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, so if cos, so if you're passing in cos as your initial state, you're going to say self dot r zero self dot v zero equals t dot t, where t is the uh, tools. Um, and I'll show you the function after this. I'm just going to show you how it's going to implement it in the orbit propagator class. Um, t dot um, cos to r v, and then r zero v zero c v mu, because this matters. Or mu equals c v mu. And then if it's not cos, then just pass it straight in. Else, um, self dot r zero equals state zero until three, and then self dot v zero equals state zero after three. Um, and then the rest can pretty much just go through by itself because then you make your initial conditions and blah blah blah. Hopefully that doesn't have any errors, but we'll see. I don't think it does. Um, okay, so next is the tool. So I didn't actually want to type this out during the video. Um, I thought it just wouldn't, you wouldn't really get much out of it. It's just a bunch of equations. Um, so basically, you're passing in your codes. 
and you're telling it if you pass it in degrees, usually you do, um, so then you can convert those degrees to radians because degrees are better, you know, for humans as far as visualizing. Uh, so you pass that in, and your mu because your mu matters in this calculation. Um, so the first thing you have to calculate is eccentric anomaly. Um, there's just another um, kind of algorithm that I just didn't want to bore anyone with it. But in this one, we actually have the true anomaly and eccentricity, which is straight from the codes, which is a very simple equation right here. So that's not too hard to implement. There's just another version of doing this where you can find the eccentric anomaly from the mean anomaly and the eccentricity instead of the true anomaly and eccentricity. Um, but you'd actually not have to worry about that because I don't even know when else I use that. Probably just for some other orbits problems. Um, and I'll explain real quick because we're using a true anomaly and eccentricity, which I would explain, but real quick as far as mean anomaly and what this eccentric anomaly is. Um, so eccentric anomaly, we got uh, Wolfram here. Um, basically, you have, this is your elliptical, or, elliptical orbit, um, and then you have this reference orbit around, um, which is, or auxiliary circle, they call it here. Um, which is a circumcircle of an ellipse, so it just touches both sides along the semi-major axis. Yeah, semi-major, so the long way. Um, you just have this arbitrary circle that's just used for geometry calculations. And basically, your eccentric anomaly is this E, um, where you have you're you're at this point right now, um, in that in this point in the orbit, and you take kind of a line from your eccentricity vector, which is it points at your perigee. And you take a line that's perpendicular to that and go straight to the point P. And wherever it touches on the outer arbitrary circle, um, that angle right there is E. And I'm going to post a link for this one because obviously I didn't take too much time to explain it. But there's just some geometry that's there. And then as far as your mean anomaly, it's, um, it's when you have a circle that has, or an orbit that's circular that has the same period as your elliptical orbit. And it's just a mean value. So in a circular orbit, you have a mean motion which is constant because you're in a circular orbit so however much time so if in this orbit your perigee is here you go to here you get this far in some amount of time if you were in that same arbitrary orbit that just has that is circular with the same period you would have only gone this far and that's your mean anomaly angle again it's not the most important thing in the world to actually know what these are it's just that you're going to use them in calculations that are here in the derivation of whatever it is um so from there you're gonna just gather some this is an equation where you have your semi major axis, your eccentricity, and your true anomaly that you can find what the magnitude of your um, position vector is. And then you want them in the perifocal frame, where the perifocal frame is this frame that's defined as your x-axis of the frame is pointed at your perigee point. Um, so the closest point right there, that's or P or X, whatever you want to call it. The z-axis is pointed um, normal to uh, your orbital plane, which is the same as your angular momentum of the orbit, which is the same as when you take the cross product of your position and your velocity because it's pointing normal to that plane. And then the y just completes the system. Uh, so that's what's happening there. And um, yeah, you can see that there's only motion um, in, so it's X, Y, and Z. There's no motion in the Z for either of these for the, or no motion or no values in the Z because, um, it's defined as being, the Z axis is defined as perpendicular to both the position and the velocity vector. So you're not going to have any of the position or the velocity in that direction. Um, you take a transpose, uh, east side of perifocal. Um, this is again, just lots of trig and calculations that I didn't want to bore anyone with. Um, it's kind of a nuisance to type out, but you just do it once you get it over with and it's done, and then it's just there forever. Um, you take a dot product to convert from perifocal to ECI, or whatever inertial frame you have. In this case, it's ECI. And then you just return the values. Again, not going too much into the algorithm, but um, I'll just post a link to where we're getting to the software. So that's the software side of that. I mean, you can kind of just pause it, and if you want to plug it in, go ahead. So that's done. Uh, that's your algorithm to take classical orbital elements to your R and V vectors in your inertial frame. Orbit propagator is done. So then we'll just do some examples um, where you pass in your code. So say for um, you define your central body here, T span, whatever. Um, I just want to do a few examples of just some different types of orbits. So the first one I have is the ISS because I keep saying I'm going to do an ISS orbit. Um, so I'm going to put this here so I can see it. Um, uh, here we go. Okay, so, so this is the ISS orbit. Um, this uh, website called Heavens Above, it has a lot of good data on a bunch of different satellites. Um, 
there's uh, some others like Celeste Track and Space Track. Um, they all just have TLEs. Uh, TLEs are two line elements. I think I'll do a video on that one next. Um, just what those are because they're pretty important. And then you can, if you want, track whatever you want because these are updated pretty frequently. Seventh uh, of August. Yeah, that's today in European time. Um, yeah, so these are pretty good to use. Um, so you have your orbital elements here where first is your center major axis. So, and that's just the average of your perigee and apogee. So I'll just put it at 414. Um, so CD radius plus 414. It's not gonna really have any difference in when you actually see it. Um, eccentricity is this, plug that in. Um, inclination is where did it go? Inclination. You see that just updated the page just refreshed, so it gets updated pretty, especially when you have the ISS. Um, it gets updated pretty frequently. Um, true anomaly. I mean that doesn't really matter at this time, so I'm just gonna put zero because I'm just showing the whole orbit, so it doesn't really matter what true anomaly is. Argument of perigee. Uh, where did it go? Argument of perigee. Here we go. And then right ascending, right ascension, right ascending node. That's like the long way to do it. There's other people call it just something shorter, but it doesn't really matter. So that's the ISS. Um, so you can see what the ISS is. Uh, C1. I was thinking of doing just a geostationary satellite, so you can see kind of the magnitude of how far away um, low Earth orbit is from geostationary satellites. It's pretty large. They're 35,000 kilometers away, um, directly over the equator. So geo uh, C1 equals. CD radius um, plus altitude, so that's from the Earth's surface, not from the center of the Earth, so that's why it's CB radius, uh, 35,800, and um, they're circular, so they don't have an uh, eccentricity, um, they're not inclined because they're on the equator, and then true anomaly doesn't matter, I think that's the right amount of zero. Um, let's say for one more, I'll just do something random. Uh, C2 equals CD radius uh, plus, let's just say like 50 or 2,000. I think that's Mio. Mio is somewhere. Um, maybe do 3,000. I'll make it more um, eccentric because these are both pretty circular. Um, maybe it'll be like 0.3. Hopefully it doesn't crash into Earth. Um, inclination, let's give it like 20 degrees because why not again? And um, TA is zero. I'll give him an argument of perigee, 15, and then a rand of 40. That's just a very random. Then you create your orbit propagator instances. OP0 equals OP, where you have your initial state is C0, T span DT, cos equals true. Oh, one thing I want to make sure I got cos to RV. Um, Oh, yeah, I did mess that up. Hmm. I don't know how I caught that. And then it's say degrees equals true because we're passing in degrees. Um, and we usually always will. There's no, I can't, I don't think of radians. In radians, I don't think anyone else does. Um, cos equals true. And then I'm just going to copy and paste because it's just the same thing three times. And two, T1, cos equals, and then propagate orbit. Propagate orbit. I don't like this keyboard. You probably noticed how many typos I have. And then the classic t dot plot in orbit. So that's why I wanted to do this function because it's really useful for these type of things. Op zero dot rs. One dot rs. Op two dot rs. Labels equals um, ISS. Geo satellite. And then just random. And then show plot equals true. Plot equals true. Here we go. All right, let's see what kind of errors we're looking at. No way. There's zero errors. That's amazing. Oh, except I do see. Oh, here it is. Oh, so there's something wrong with the International Space Station here. Oh, no, it's not. I'm just looking at it. It's the way that it's viewed. So this is the thing about, um, wow, there actually was no errors, except I want to do something because I do prefer to have, where is it? I don't have a dark theme thing on here. Okay, whatever. Um, anyways, wow, that was amazing. There was no errors.
Um, so you can see uh, kind of the difference of how far out these geostationary satellites are, the green ones. Um, they're pretty far. And then, so you can see the International Space Station here. It's a pretty inclined. So if you look at it from equatorial to X, Y here, um, you can see the inclination there. It's pretty significant. Um, yeah, there's a the whole thing. And yeah, these um, little orbits are just kind of just barely on the surface there. And then the random one, which is kind of bigger orbit, and it actually got pretty close there. But you can see it's more um, elliptical than the other ones. Um, obviously, this other one, that's just perfectly circular. It's kind of not the best view of it, but that is a circular orbit. And then this one you can see is more elliptical than this view. Yeah. And the ISS orbit's pretty much circular and pretty close to the pretty close to the surface. So yeah, I think that's about it on that. Um, yep. Let's see. Yep. So yeah, I think what I'm going to do next is a two line element. So like you saw in the, um, and I'll do the ISS example again, but right here, these are two line elements um, where this is the data that you get like from these websites. Sometimes they don't even convert it. Or if you have your own satellite and you're tracking it, you'll get a two line element sent from whoever you paid um, to track your satellite and then you just plug that into your simulator and see where you are and you know can get uh, precisions and passes of when you can see your satellite so you, you can see right now um, when this video is being filmed um, the ISS is somewhere near over Florida kind of close to Florida so you can probably see it from Florida if it's oh no it's daytime so you're not going to be able to see it but yeah that's about it uh, next video I'll cover TLEs um, let me know if there's anything too fast too slow again anything I should do differently or anything else you want to see. Yep. Thank you for watching.